disrupts the sermon, will you get him to come up and, and preach with me? I don't know if that would be worth it or not. <laughs> yeah, distracting. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah, it probably does. Great! So um, I'm stealing shamelessly from Joe to catch, but I'm sure that's allowed. We get a weekly update uh, from, I guess, because we get a weekly update about good stuff. I don't, I don't know if he writes all of that stuff. I, I, if he does, he's very busy because it's very, very good. Um, and he uh, gave a couple of sessions on grace, and I thought this will be the sin sermon, you know, because sin and grace kind of go together, I suppose. Um, and his whole idea of going through this, and a lot of the topics you can make sermons out of, but this one he did a two-part series, and there was a couple of quotes that really just floored me, and I just wanted to ex explain grace. And you can't have a sermon about grace without smiling. Like every quote, every verse, everything about grace makes you happy. Like it's, it's scandalous, irrational, risky, but it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's it's amazing. And uh, our church really understands grace because we were one of these people, um, irrational. I'll go through a couple of people. That we'll do some fun role playing or, or something or stepping through logic later. And we were one of these people that were, you know, very legalistic and making sure we're doing everything correctly. And, and uh, I want to explore that a little bit because it'll mean quite a bit to us, um, people that have had grace all their life, maybe not. But I thought this would be an interesting sermon to discuss and uh, sort of talk about sin a bit. And I, I toyed with the guys, or teased the guys from SCP, uh, but they're not here. <laughs> so I'll have to give it again, maybe. Um, but, uh, and we'll probably, uh, we'll see them. So I wanted to start off with a story about a tree. And uh, this is a story that I remember uh, Gordon Graham giving a long time ago, like 20 years ago. And he talked about a tree. Of course, I'm going to make it my own because like 20 years ago, I forget what he was saying. But I kind of got bits and pieces of it. But I like the graphic here. So they've got a tree. So obviously the tree is killing the poor guy. And, uh, and I'll go ahead and read it. And we'll just we'll play with this a little bit. So once upon a time, there was a tree that people tried to follow. They grew up knowing each and every facet of the tree. That what the tree, you know, how to make the tree happy. And things that make the tree angry and sad and all these other things. The people strive so much to do what is right. To follow the rules that the tree had created. They spent their lives measuring up themselves against the tree, trying to be upright. Some thought they were winning. Some knew they were losing. But ultimately, everyone was losing and the tree was killing everyone. So, anyone know what the tree is? What's this tree I'm talking about? It's the law, right? So the law was, and I know I'm embellishing here, a tree, so it's like this figurative thing, but the law was there, put in place, but it was killing people. And you're like, killing people? What are you talking about? What is, what is that? So that's the Old Covenant. When we, Israel, God established a law for Israel, and they couldn't follow it. They couldn't keep the Old Covenant. The rules, the commands, and everything that God gave them. But they were, also, they were not able to keep the rules and commandments. And neither are we right now, including us. we breaking the law. We're breaking it right now. So that's my segue into grace, obviously, because that is the old covenant, the law, right? And, and I don't remember if Gordon Graham actually used a tree. I thought he did, but anyway, so that's your graphic to sort of start off with. Uh, so let's go to scripture to start with. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that is our staple verse that we go back to think, Oh, sin. Who cares about sin? Yeah, whatever. Well, sin is death. We should care about that. We all, you know, a lot of us here, most of us here, I think everyone here wants to live, right? We all want to not die, right? So I'll give you an analogy. Think of a parent and a child. When a parent, a child disobeys, the relationship with the parent is strained, right? So you, yeah, you want it like in The Simpsons, you know, choke Bart out, right? The parent still loves the child, and they still have the child's best interests at heart, uh, and the child never stops belonging to the parent. So that relationship never, you know, stops. However, the child may experience some constraints, right? Some mistrust. There's going to be discipline involved, a sense of guilt, all these things added uh, that actually mar the image of the relationship. You better pay there to go. 
You're going to preach with me? Okay, let's, yeah, we'll keep going. So that's the same thing it is with God. When we rebel against God in our rules, in our lives, the same thing happens. You know, God just doesn't quit being our godly father. But that death, that thing that we saw in Scripture there, a brokenness results in pain, right? And uh, when we have communion with God, a sense of purpose and righteousness, all these things, you know, like they're marred, right? So that's the reason why, you know, we stop and think about the wage of sin is death. And we're going to go on to the definition of sin, we're going to go on to the definition of grace, so we know what we're talking about here. But that's the staple verse, right? So, there's also in Deuteronomy, all the way back to the Old Covenant, here, life versus death. So, Deuteronomy 30, 18 through 20. Uh, and this was uh, when they, God was working with Israel, and he was going to you know, send them out to, to get uh, the land. And he says, I call heaven and earth to witness before you today, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursings. Therefore, choose life. So this is a theme that's gone through, a motif that's gone through the Bible already. You know, God gives life and death. But he's saying, choose life. Please choose life. But he's giving us that choice, right? So... So he says, you know, choose life that you'll be, your offspring may live and live long in obeying the voice of God. And then the life and the length of your days may be, you know, long in, in what uh, Abraham and Isaac and, and the inheritance. So choose life. Why? Because, you know, your inheritance and, and your life will be better, right? So let's take a look at uh, the GCI Statement of Faith. And, and by the way, if you don't know this exists, which so we used to have a little book that it would have, but it is online. So if you go where we have Jody Catch sermons and stuff, you can actually go see you know, the statement of faith and you can actually see what we believe, which is kind of convenient. I just drop it in the slide and read from it. Uh, but sin is lawlessness. That is the state of condition of rebellion against God. So nothing against God, right? From the time sin entered the earth, the human race through Adam and Eve, Humanity has been under a yoke, a yoke that only can be removed by grace. So now we're going to talk about grace, right, as the sermon through Jesus Christ. The sinful condition of humanity is manifested in the tendencies to choose self and self-interest over God and God's will. So we're always wanting to look for self. And incidentally, I'm going to talk about the two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And that analogy that we've known, and we'll discuss it a bit later, is about choosing ourself, you know, knowing good and evil ourself, or choosing life. So I've got to pick a side here. So this is life, knowledge of good and evil, the tree. So that idea of sin is saying, I'm going to pick up this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can I find you through sit down? So sin causes alienation from God, and suffering and death. Because all people sin, all of us need salvation through His Son. So, let's take a look at the definition of grace. So, sin and grace, we kind of got the same thing right. So, grace is free and unmerited, and it's expressed in everything He does from God. By grace, the Father redeems humanity and the entire cosmos from sin and death through Jesus Christ. And by this grace, the Holy Spirit empowers humans to know and love the Father, Jesus Christ, uh, more, and enters the uh, joy and eternal salvation of God. So the idea here is that it empowers human. So not only is it uh, erasing sin or getting sin away from us, but also empowers us to know and, and love God more, which is interesting. I never caught that, but that is really an encompassing of grace. And we'll talk a little bit more about what grace is and how the grace is, is uh, we, we can... Try and understand grace, I guess. We're going to do some analogies and stuff, just trying to bite into this a little bit more. So, number one, it is scandalous. And I looked for slides on the internet for scandalous, and that was probably about the most appropriate that I could find. Is that is really, sin, grace is scandalous. It is sort of, you know, something that we don't deserve, right? How can God forgive uncontrollable, un Everything, uncon unconditionally, for everything, everything that's ever been done. It's, aren't some sins worse than others? Aren't some people worse than others? When you stop and think about this, um, you think of, you know, serial killers and stuff. You think, well, that's a worse sin than, you know, lying on a test or something like that. And it is scandalous that God would cover all of that and say, I love you no matter what. That grace is available to everyone. So it seems 
you know, not fair, which is a couple irrational, like this guy. You know, he's saying it's not right. It's not meant to be. It's not there. So irrational because it offends our sort of right and wrong nature, the sense of fairness and justice. You think, well, that's not fair. You know, this person lied and stealed and, you know, like that. And I only did a little lie. It's not fair that we're covered over grace and grace covers all of that. That doesn't seem fair. It's irrational. And it is irrational, right? Um, in Scripture, we know that in Matthew, uh, discuss about the, uh, remember the Lord, uh, I guess the landlord was saying, I will, you know, give so many people uh, work. You know, some work 12 hours, some work 8 hours, some work 6 hours, and they all get the same pay. You think, that's irrational. That's not fair, right? And, well, truly it's not. And grace is like that. So uh, it pulls that out of us. I love this slide. Risky. Maybe you want to, you know, ride your bike and not flip. That's pretty scary. I don't know who caught that or if that's actually Photoshop, but that's pretty, pretty daring, right? So grace is risky, right? Doesn't it open the door for lawlessness and unrighteousness? So when we made our changes in WCG, I guess, we made, Worldwide Church of God made our changes, we were opening the door to like, hey, everybody, come on and sin. It's, it's, you're allowed to sin now. Grace covers everything. You think, wow, that's risky. Why did we ever, you know, open our doctrine to that? And I remember some sermons that, you know, People come up after and ask the, the pastor and the minister and saying, you know, you can't preach this stuff. People are just going to do whatever they want. They're just going to go out. And and I, I want you to stop and think about that for a moment, right? So sin we've discussed is marred image of God. It's not what God wants and stuff. But uh, he's opening it up for us to do whatever we want. Just stop and think about that. That's what. That's why it is risky. You know, does it, doesn't it open the door of lawlessness and... and unrighteousness and all these things? We'll just ponder that for a moment. We're going to explore a little, lot deeper than that, but, you know, that, that is really, really, it is, does look risky, right? So let's look at 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Rather, join us in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given in us, or us in Jesus, from before the beginning of time. But it's now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality through the gospel. So notice it says here, he has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of what we've done, but what God is doing. So this idea of God giving us grace, it's not about our merit, what we're trying to do, or you know, trying to run away from sin or all these things. It's what God is doing. It's an overpowering thing that God is, is doing amongst us. I'm going to explore it a little bit more as we go along, but I want you to you know, kind of let these thoughts sink in as we keep going here. So grace is counterintuitive. Uh, God's living, uh, Spirit leading in us to bear fruit as we live our lives in union with Christ. So we don't produce the fruit that comes forth. We share what the Lord has given us. So this fruit and this life and this communion, these things that are going on that when we offer our lives to God, fruit happens. And it's not, we're not producing that fruit. Um, it, it happens because we're, we're witnesses and we're participating in that fruit. We're not the ones doing it. So God is letting us be involved in, in something amazing, you know, the, the, that grace fills us and grace comes over us and, and we have this, you know, wonderful life and we're watching these fruit and these things of God, you know, as it goes on. So, so that is kind of a tease, you know, like, well, you got all that beautiful sort of life or you got to go back to your life of sin, right? Well, sin is good, it's fun, but this is like, you know, it's amazing stuff, right? Let's take a look at another scripture, 2 Titus eleven fourteen. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to the ungodliness and worldly passions. So grace teaches that stuff. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in our present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of God our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify his people to his very own, eager to do what is good. So we see what we've got here, that, that it teaches us. So grace comes over us, it teaches us to say no to ungodly. 
So we still got the option, oh, yeah, sin, you know, it's leather. Grace teaches us. It comes in and actually teaches us the right way of living. This quote, <clears throat> uh, when I was reading Joy to Catch, and I pulled this one out, and the pin dropped. I was like, wow, I understand. So as we, you know, talk through different things, maybe scripture will make the pin drop, maybe there's... This quote from Spurgeon will make the pin drop. Maybe as we massage and try and understand and go through some analogies, it'll make the pin drop. Um, we're talking about things in words, but this concept is not in words. So um, that's why we keep, you know, keep gnawing on it, keep chewing on it, keep trying to understand what grace is. So here's Charles Spurgeon's um, you know, attempt on, on grace or looking at sin. And I thought it was great. When I thought God was hard, I found it easy to sin. But when I found God so kind, so good, so overflowing in compassion, I beat my breast to think I could ever rebel against one who loved me and sought me so good. I thought, isn't that a way of putting it upside down? So we thought if someone's hard, you're like, oh, that's easy. Oh, this guy's always whining about something. But God is like so kind, so loving. So, and that grace comes over, so like, oh, how can I not want to do the right thing? So you sort of see the opposite, you know, spectrum there. Grace, it's not about, you know, trying to, oh, I can free to do what I want. It's, it's about choosing life. It's about choosing God. It's about choosing to live in that grace and, and to find that. So grace has no, there's nothing we can do. And this was something that was really difficult for our church to grab onto because we did things. And, and we were, you know, holy days and we did Sabbath and we did our Bible study. And, and, we, and with good things to do. We did things, but when with that taken away from us when we did our change in doctrine, that was shocking for a lot of us. We're like, well, we don't have to do anything? We can't do anything? It, it kind of took a sense of our, our self away, did it? Well, let's run through some of these things. Nothing we can do to make us God love God. Nothing we can do can make God love us more. So nothing we do can make us God love us. There's nothing. He loves us as, as it is, right, ultimately. There's nothing we can do less or, or to make God love us less. So we're sort of stuck in this thing, you know, like we can't, God won't love us more or less. You know, God loves us and infinitely, right? So God has already loved us infinitely is the next point. So there's nothing more, nothing less. We're just, we're captivated into it in His grace. So abiding deeply in that grace, we jump deeply into that grace. His grace changes us. That's where things happen is when we decide to say, yes, Lord. I, I, the sinful life, you know, I'm still living. Like I know I can do all this, and you will still love me, but I want to jump into that grace, and it'll change you, right? And you become a changed being, and, that, and that's what it's about. It's not something, you know, we can understand. It's a spiritual process. <clears throat> Here's another uh, uh, thought from Joe DeCatch's uh, Bible study. A long obedience in the same direction. The central reality for Christians is the personal an unalterable, preserving commitment that God makes to us. Preservation is not the result of our damnation. It's the result of God's faithfulness. We survive in a way of in faith, not because of extraordinary stamina, but in God's righteousness. So we always thought about, you know, faith. Oh, is it my faith that's doing this? No, it's Christ's faith that comes on to us. So it's abiding in the same direction. I love this slide, you know, pointing it. Every one of us and myself, you know. God never condemns us. I thought that was very interesting. Yes. Our sins are grievous for God because they hurt us and others. They also mar the relationship and the image that God has put on us. But our sins don't determine whether or how much God loves us. So we used to, you know, a lot of people still put baggage on oh, the sinner. I can't go to church. It's the lightning will hit the church. Well, it's not about that. It's about a relationship. It's about love uh, that God is doing for us. Um, I put this slide in here because this is a third week, I think he did, about the Pharisee, right? So this is an image of the Pharisee teacher uh, that muttered, uh, This man becomes a sinner and eats with them. So Jesus, who's, so this is Jesus, obviously with a sinner here, right? Uh, Jesus, who is ultimately fishers of men and women, uh, rubs shoulders with the people and the sinners, all of the people, to catch people, right? So, to, you know, so God, Jesus was in about, so this concept of sin... Jesus entered into our sinful world, into all these situations, to capture us, to get us, you know. And he's not scared that sin is going to scar him or whatever. And he just, he wants us, right? So this is an image that, you know, God, you know, went in and said, this sinful woman, I'm going to go right, you know. And that's so precious, you know, that our God would, 
you know, a glorious being. And says, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll jump inside and I'll do this for you. What love and commitment, what intimacy that he has for us, that he'll minister to us and come into our mess and our, our shack, if you will, or you know, all these things that we, we uh, have in our lives. I like this image, and this little, um, and I just put it in there, so maybe that's the contact of Jesus on this life. But we have to focus on Jesus, not ourselves. When we look out, are we looking out through Jesus' lens? I don't know what this slide is supposed to portray or whatever, but the idea is that, you know, we are the children of God. We are, you know, we, we put that grace upon ourselves, and we can see the eye, uh, the eye, through the eye, we see the world through Jesus. And we have the Holy Spirit that communes with us, and we have the opportunity to, you know, sort of see, you know, Jesus in everywhere we see. Uh, so Christians' discipleship is a process of paying more attention to God's righteousness. So we're looking more at that grace and less attention on our own, the less attention about ourselves, finding meaning in our lives not by probing our moods and our morals and all those things and everything, all that stuff, believing in God's purpose. That's the pointing. You know, so that's where we're, we're pointing in that righteousness. So it's not about mapping. Uh, it's about mapping our faithfulness of God. You know, trying to look at that, what God is doing. Not charting all these little rises and falls of our lives, right? It's about focusing on that grace. And um, if you can think of, you know, like uh, kind of a, a path or something, a flow or something. Um, I've been watching Star Trek lately, and there's so many analogies that they you watch, and you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. And one of them was this analogy of this guy that, um, these super beings or whatever, they're in this really far place of the galaxy or whatever, and they just wanted to know people. So what they did is they, they made one person on the, the ship or whatever, I think his name was Barkley or whatever, it's kind of a, not really an impressive character or whatever, but they made him brilliant, like he was so amazing and... You know, he, he exploded into this knowledge of understanding of how all these things work so that he could make the ship go as far and then meet these beings. And I thought, somehow, that's kind of what God is doing. I know um, I'm in good company because Jody Cat likes Star Trek. <laughs> He's a Trekkie. Uh, but the idea that I, when I saw that, I was like, God is doing something like that. Our mortal beings cannot understand God. We have no way of getting to that exterior universe, right? But Jesus and the Holy Spirit communes with us and we zip into this grace kind of portal and just, boom, when we find God, we see God. And that's sort of what's happening because God's grace comes on to us, you know, his faithfulness and that union. And we become more of, of what we're, of just flesh and blood. We become a spirit being and, and we can commune with God. So that's special. That's amazing. And that's where our focus needs to be when we stop well, thinking about sin. Oh, does God uh, it's like, no, it's more about, you know, what God is doing in our lives than, than some of the sins. So Ezekiel here, a <coughs> good prophet. Uh, yes, God is uh, implacably opposed to sin, for he takes no delight in seeing his creation be merged, be smirched, or wrecked, right? Yet sin and evil do not decrease God's love for us. So this is an Old Testament prophet saying this, right? So we knew this back in the Old Covenant. Note that God says through Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, but so turn and live. So even at that point, Ezekiel is telling, you know, live, you know, choose life, you know, go for blessings and curses, no, choose life, choose God's way. Now I was going to stop and mention about the two trees. So I'm sure all of us in, in uh, catechism or YES or, you know, youth church or whatever learned about the two trees. And I remember growing up thinking it was the knowledge of the uh, good and evil, right? And then my mom corrected me, no, it's not. No, that's wrong. You know, it's the knowledge, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So let me explain that a little bit. Um, it's probably a review for most of you. But the knowledge of the good and evil was like saying, I am my own God. I know what is good. I know what is evil. I can make my own decisions. I am my own person. I don't need you, God. Tree of Life says, I don't know any of that stuff. I need you, Lord. I am really, I, I want to live and abide in you. So God gave Adam and Eve and all of humanity and all of us the opportunity to eat of those two trees. So we stop and see, look at the news. And I just want you to ponder this for a second, right? Do we know the way of good? We look at our governments and how corrupt they are. Do we know the way of peace? You know, this whole, oh, this is a peace mission, and more people die. 
do we really know as humanity what we're doing on this earth? And you stop and look at the news and you go, oh my God, what are people doing? This is crazy. And the answer is no. We're in a fallen world. That's what that is, right? And Christ had to come back to give us the tree of life again, to choose life. So we stop and look at grace and we think about sin, right? Do we want to say, I know my own way, my I am going to figure it out. I'm going to focus on what I'm doing. And I can do this. Or do we step away and say, no, let grace, let your grace come over me and eat of the, tr- the tree of life. It's our choice. So in that in this aspect, it's, do we put on you know, the full armor of Christ or do we you know, let the old man, the sinful man, rule our lives? I have a short video for me, which is really for me. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's about me. That's the name of the video. And uh, this should cement into... Uh, the, the idea here that is it about us, you know, but that I'm going to figure it out, I'm the one, or is it about God? And it's a fun video, and Jody Catch put it in, nested in his update, and it's about church hymns, so our hymns that we praise and worship God. Well, what would that look like if we did it the other way around? So we'll go ahead and run. It's all about me. Really. It is all about you. Now, the greatest collection of me worship ever assembled on one CD. It's all about now I lift my name on high. All 20 songs, all about you. This amazing collection is great to share with friends, if you have any. Everyone can join in the worship with you, for you, and about you. Because you are unique, and you love you. There is none like me. And no one else All this can for do only $19.95. Like Operators do. are standing by to serve you. And I am why I sing. And I am why I live. If you order now, you'll also receive a second CD of Yule Tide Favorites. I sing. Call 1-800-ME-ME-ME or order online at memyselfandi.com Call today because no one can praise you like you. So this parody expresses the foolishness of work in ourselves. An egocentric worship leader sings praises and worship songs. But what a selfish twist. Your congregation will laugh and reflect on the the worship towards the Lord. So this was obviously from YouTube, and that was the description of the video that the guy put up. I thought that was interesting. So when you stop and think, do you want to sing songs like it's all about me? No, we don't. Uh, Because, you know, we're mortal beings, and we're prone to, to error, and we've fallen. But we want to sing about God because He is true and, and wonderful. Now, I said I was going to do this, <clears throat> and the reason I want to do this, and we'll spend five minutes or so doing this, is because I want you to stop and think about sin and grace and quality of life. So three things, right? So I'm going to run through this. All right. So you can write on paper, or you can you know imagine in your mind or, or whatever you want. But we're going to do the following, right? So come up with an analogy or example of sin. You know, maybe that's something that's a sinful, you know, uh, person or whatever, maybe like that, or or a concept of sin or what you think of it. And then step through God's grace on this analogy. So uh, step through thinking, okay, when God's grace is applied to that sin, what happens, right? So think about that. So it could be like an analogy of a person, a type of person. Uh, and then, you know, when, when they sin or if they try not to sin or whatever. And then God's grace is put the, upon them. You know, what grace is, an analogy. And then the third one is, what's the outcome? What's the quality of life? And, and I'm going to give you a hint because I did this already. I did three people, right? So I did three people's idea, you know. And, and, and when grace came on that person, and then what was the quality of outcome? Because what I'm getting at here is that, you know, sin is abound everywhere. But grace covers everything. Now, what's the quality of life? And I want you to stop and think about, well, I can do whatever I want. You know, can you do whatever you want? And then, you know, so I want you to spend about, you know, maybe five minutes on that and just think about it. And I'll uh, have a sip of coffee.
come back up in the sky. Kind of a daunting topic, and I'm like, stop. Wow, what does he want? What are you talking about? What I was trying to do is to get you guys thinking, so sort of in your own words, your own minds, of what sin is and what grace is. And just to stop and try and figure out, because no analogy we come up with is going to figure this out. God's grace. Is, you read it. If you're having a blue day or down day, read about God's grace. Oh, what a pick me up. It's amazing. It's 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 irrational. It's it's it doesn't make sense, but it's something that God gave us, right? So I'm going to step through three things, and you know, keep writing notes if you want. But uh, person number one. So I look for a person that with no regards, and believe it or not, the internet doesn't portray that at all. You know, someone jumping off bridges, somebody, you know, mass murdering people. So I thought, oh, danger, this guy, Hannibal Lecter, right? Something like that. So you stop and think. Okay. When I said, you can sin and do whatever you want, and God's grace will cover you. Okay, that's person number one. I am going to do everything I want. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to steal. I'm going to murder. I'm going to do all these things. No regards. I'm just going to go nuts on people, right? And I wanted you to stop and think about the shack, because William Young pulled this out in The Ladybug Killer, right? And he discussed this particular topic in the book. And he says, God loves the Ladybug Killer. God has grace in that person, which is like, oh, how do you wrap your mind around that? That's unfair. That's inconceivable. It's, you know, you can't do that, right? But God's grace does cover that. Now, I'm not going to leave it there because you think, well, God just loves everybody and it's all just, so no regard. I'm going to do whatever I want. God's grace covers me, but what's the result? That person, do you think they're going to accept that grace and, and, and want that grace? Not really. They're set in their ways. They want to sin as much as they can. So what's their result? If you interview, if you could, you know, serial killers or people that are, you know, uh, always in trouble with the law and stuff, are they happy people? Do they have community? Do they have family? Do they have love? Do they, is their heart beating or is it like a heart of stone, right? Stop and think about that. Grace covers that person, but there's no relationship. There's nothing. That sin is just killing that marring that, you know, relationship. There's nothing that can penetrate that. So sure, you can just sin as much as you want, but then there's your lifestyle. You're, you got nothing. You can't jump into that grace of God because you're sinning. If they, they kind of don't coexist. So that's person number one. So you stop and think, well, I don't want to be that person. Person number two. I told you to come to this. The upright legalistic person. So this is somewhat like our church, right? You know, we had to do so many hours of Bible study. We had to go to church. We had to keep the holy days. We had to keep all these rules. And that was nice. It was nice to be able to dot the I's and cross the T's and do our stuff in our life. Now you stop and look at that person, right? So God's grace covers that person, right? What's the result? Well... You know, they're still following their rules. They're God's rules, but they're still following them. And they're blindsided to all this beautiful open world of grace that's out there. Because they're like, i got to really focus on this. Um, Israel was like this um, until the New Covenant. And uh, when Christ came to earth, the guy that is all about grace, what are the Sadducees and the, you know, the Pharisees and all those legal people, right? They were like this. They had to keep everything. And then they're just, oh, you're a terrible person. Grace came in flesh and blood, and they just walked away. So what was their quality of life, right? When you stop and look at it, they didn't have a relationship with God. They didn't have that graceful, you know, that world open up to them. They were still just, I'm going to keep the rules, keep the rules, keep the rules, keep the rules. So what I'm point painting here is that God's grace covers all these people, right? Person number one, person number two, but what's the outcome? If you're not, you know, giving your life to God and abiding in His grace, your outcome is not as good as it could be. This person is better than the first person, but not ultimate. Third person, I get on the internet, like who doesn't want to be this person living a grace-filled life, you know, in Photoshop and looking wonderful? 
So abiding in God's grace. So this is the third person. When you say, yes, I accept you know, that sin is in my life, but I want to embrace grace. I want to jump into that, you know, that, uh, that, that thing that you've created for us, you know, that way, that unity, that, you know, that you know, wormhole or something to you, God. I want to jump into that grace. I want to abide in that grace. I want to live there. As much as I can, yeah, I still get stuff I have to, you know, dust off and whatever, but I still want to abide in that grace. Now, what happens there? What's the result there? <gasps> the heavens open up and, you know, Photoshop and whatever. Like, beautiful things happen because we are now exploring how God created us, the whole being. Yeah, we have sin, we have marred image and all that stuff, but it's more about that. It's more about the relationship that God has done with us and the grace. And that's why, you know, if you're having a down day or something, just think of this person. Think of that type, you know, just, wow, God's grace covers us. But and to embrace that grace, what a, what a trip, you know, like amazing, amazing, you know, things can happen and, and do happen when we give our life to God. So grace, scandalous, irrational, risky, it's all of these things, right? But it's, it's so much about the heart of God and who God is and, and what he's doing with us and, and how he's, you know, come down and taken us away from this sinful life and moved us into a, a life where we could just, you know, smell better and feel better and explore things and our eyes are open. And, and this is the world God's created. And obviously it's a spiritual thing. So you go talk to people at the supermarket and say, well, you know, sinning doesn't really matter. You know, like, let me tell you about God, you know. They're like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. But if they saw you before you, you were a Christian and after, wow. They can see the difference. People recognize those things. And that's ultimately what God wants us to do, is to walk our lives and to continually carry the kingdom with us, to bless other people and to, you know, show them that grace. And it's not about us, right? The video said, it's not about me. It's about pointing to God and saying, wow, I found, you know, God is grace. you got to try this. This is amazing. And it truly is amazing grace. And, and this topic, obviously, you know, can have thousands of sermons on it. Uh, but I just wanted to share that with you today. So with that, we'll end in prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, Father, we're so thankful that um, your grace abides, abounds everywhere. And it's it's here with us now. Your spirit, your sweet, sweet, soft whisper of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds. We tackled the subject of sin and grace and trying to understand what sin does. And it's, it mars the image. And it, it really it detaches us from you, Lord. So... We pray that we can live lives full of grace. We can be the third person. We can jump into that grace. We can embrace it and just, you know, go to light speed to see you and to be with you all the time, Lord. We pray also that when we watch the news and we see that, you know, the governments are failing and there's corruption and there's selfishness and there's just so many things. It's difficult to watch the news, but yet it's important so that when we talk to our neighbor over the fence or at Safeway or in places, and you're saying, you know what? The news is depressing, but there's a better way. And let me tell you about it. So we pray that we can get that opportunity to share your grace with other people. And we pray for the people that aren't here, and we pray for the people that maybe listen later, or you know, that we can share with um, this message. And we're so thankful that you know we have that. The Word of God is something that's just not going to go away. It's for eternity. Your words are eternal. And we can hang on to those words in, in times of craziness um, that we face. So we thank you so much for our time now that we spent worshiping you and being with you. And we pray that we can be with you in the coming weeks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.